Good to see you again. <laughs> oh, did you see this? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you guys got plenty of water, is it? Anytime you need more water. I did. You never know. Yeah, whenever you want. It's up to him. Good evening. My name is Matt Yedlichka, and I serve as a board member for the Central District of Nebraska Farm Bureau. I welcome you here tonight to the District 23 Legislative State Legislative Candidate Forum. Nebraska's economic foundation is its and its largest industry is agriculture. Nearly one out of every four Nebraska jobs is generated by agriculture. I believe the election of our next leaders is one of the most important decisions Nebraska voters will make. It will impact prosperity of our state over the next four years. Our number one goal this evening is to provide an opportunity for our members and the public at large to hear from the candidates for legislature and how they respond to questions that impact agriculture in rural Nebraska. Nebraska Farm Bureau is a grassroots statewide farm ranch organization that represents more than 55,000 member families across the state. We are dedicated to supporting farm and ranch families in working for the benefit of all Nebraskans through a wide variety of educational, service, and advocacy efforts. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I would like to take, thank each of you for attending in person tonight and taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to the candidates. Following tonight's forum, though, we will be hosting an informal reception where you will have the opportunity to visit one-on-one -on -one with each of the candidates. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our moderator, who I consider a friend and one of the most famous voices in Nebraska. So if you will help me welcome our moderator, Susan Littlefield. Well, good evening, everybody. I do apologize. My voice is not up to par, thanks to bronchitis. So we will push through, and I think it's a great opportunity tonight to hear from all of our candidates and, and what they have to say. And this is your time to be able to ask the questions. And again, Adam does have the cards, and if you would like to write down a question, um, write it down and raise your hand, and he will pick it up and then bring it over here to the table. I did want to let you know that Larissa Schultz was invited. Uh, she did have a family emergency, and so she was unable to attend tonight. But we wish uh, her all the best with what is happening right now with her family. With that, this is the fun part. Um, we're going to kind of start off with everybody's going to get two minutes to make an opening statement. After those two minutes, and they do have a clock, so they'll be able to watch on there. We will come back with questions from you in the audience, and each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer those questions. So we will start first with Jacob. Hey, good evening, everybody. A uh, special thank you to Jay Ferris and the Nebraska Farm Bureau of each of the counties within this phenomenal district for inviting us. I think this is great uh, with the civic involvement and all the movement that Farm Bureau does across the state and, and across the country, really. My name is Jacob Wolf. I'm a fifth generation Nebraskan, and I'm proud of it. I went to the US Naval Academy straight out of high school. 
Uh, I studied in ocean engineering, which is weird. A kid from Nebraska uh, wants to learn about the ocean. Uh, and then I served in the Naval Construction Force, the Navy Seabees. Uh, from there, I managed Naval and Marine Corps base and facilities. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a long night of popcorning, each of us. Um, where was that? Oh, managing Naval, Naval and Marine Corps facilities. And then I had the privilege of being a, an underwater construction diver, where I led a team of sailors around the world in support of Naval operations, uh, that ship-to-shore connection. Met my wife in Panama City, Florida, and we decided to raise our family in Nebraska. She went through the winter here, and she's still not, not uh, happy about it. Uh, but that's life. And what we really wanted to do when we got into this race was represent the next generation of Nebraskans. We looked at our uh, current president and how maybe he's kind of lost out of touch, and who else in our government is out of touch as well, and who is representing young families. And, bringing young families back into our state or not letting them leave. I came back because of a deep-rooted love for the state of Nebraska. And I want to inspire that same loyalty and feeling in each of the communities across this district and across this state. Uh, so I hope that you learned something from me tonight, and I certainly look forward to hearing your questions and learning from my opponents as well. All right. Dennis? Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you, Farm Bureau. Uh, th thanks for giving us this opportunity. And I, I really do hope you also learn something about us. And I guess I'd like to start off with, first, I'm Dennis Fuyan. I'm from Prague. I'm a lifelong Saunders County re resident. Uh, I grew up around Malmo, went to country school. Uh, after grade school, I went to Prague High School. And after high school, I went into the Navy. And I served in the Navy for four years. Uh, I was trained as a jet engine mechanic, and I was most of my duties were either flight line or I was uh, a flight crewman on a small cargo plane. So I was fortunate enough when I went to Vietnam to be able to land on aircraft carriers as a, as a crewman, not as a pilot. But uh, it was very, very exciting for a young, young farm kid. Uh, when I came home, uh, I actually planned on being an aircraft mechanic, and my dad had just bought a brand new tractor. And that was all it took. I just decided I was going to farm. And I've uh, been doing that ever since. I uh, worked about 10 years at Belmont Industries before I took over the farming, but I was farming part-time besides. Uh, I met my wife about a year after I got back from the service, and we got married about a year later. And we've been married 51 years and have two great daughters and four grandchildren, and we just love, they're the love of our life. I'm a pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, uh, I'm all about faith, family, and farming. Uh, farming is my life, but uh, life is my, is my passion. Life of the young, the unborn, we need to protect those, those unborn children. Uh, I guess, uh, oh, also I'd like to mention that uh, I've been working with the Nebraska Soybean Association and the American Soybean Association for the last 25 plus years representing farmers. I just got back from Washington, D.C. last week. And just out there relaying the message that farmers need a, a uh, farm bill. My time's up, but thank you. All right, Allie. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name's Allie French. Uh, thank you all for being here, for hearing all of us out. Uh, for me, I grew up in Nebraska, a very bland childhood. I, wasn't allowed really to watch TV. We listened to only Christian music. Um, so I developed a huge love for learning. Uh, never did a question in our household go unanswered. There was, you know, at first an encyclopedia, eventually we got to Google. Uh, but learning and, and figuring things out has always been a passion of mine. I can tell you in middle school, uh, it, was, it was funny to see me as a 12-year-old writing a 13-page research paper on aspartame when we were only assigned a three-page paper. Uh, but once I dive into something, I give it everything I've got. And so in 2019, I, I had my first child and uh, went back to school for computer programming and ended up doing a couple speeches uh, in a speech class on vaccines, neither pro nor anti, just simply about the schedule when we give them all that jazz. And I discovered medical freedom movement. I discovered a movement of 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals across this country and around the world who recognized a shift in our government that no longer represented the people. And God stirred in my heart. He, he put me in a position where I couldn't just sit by and, and watch. I had to actually go and do something about it. And lo and behold, four years later, I have started a grassroots group called Nebraskans Against Government Overreach. I have devoted my days and nights, uh, sometimes, you know, with only three hours of sleep for a month or two on end when we get into something good. And this is what I do. I want to help people. I want to represent people. And when we saw medical mandates come down in this state and across the country, I never want to see that happen again. That is my mission. That is my reason for doing this. Our, our government, in many ways, believes they have the liberty to tell us what we can and cannot do with our own medical choices, with our farming, with uh, who we sell what to, with where we can work and licensure, and I want to go and change that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Alan Zavodny, and my family consists of my wife, Rhonda, who, God willing, will celebrate 35 years in September. My oldest son, Zach, is in his first year of medical school at UNMC. And my youngest son is a senior in high school getting ready to graduate. I served as the David City Mayor for three terms, or 12 years, and I've been CEO of North Star for about 25 years. I would like to say thank you to the Butler County Farm Bureau, the Colfax County Farm Bureau, and the Saunders County Farm Bureau for having this. Today was kind of a big day for the Farm Bureau. Uh, they, uh, Senator Dover's LB 1313 advance, which is going to hopefully provide health care for people in the, of the 55,000 members of Farm Bureau. Also, uh, broadband took another step forward, and those are important things. I am humbled to be endorsed by United States Senator Deb Fisher, David City Mayor Jessica Miller, Schuyler Mayor Art Lindbergh, and County Supervisor Scott Steger. My priorities are less government. I'm a pro-life, pro-Second Amendment candidate. I've become obsessed with property taxes. I've spent a lot of windshield time, and I actually, I don't like the little rebates they give us and call it property tax relief. I think we need to start over and do a zero-based and people say, well, you're just going to propose a tax shift. Yeah, probably, because it's got so far out of whack of reliance on property taxes that we need to do something. I think we need to start over because farmers can't afford to make a living with those kinds of expenses. Um, High-speed Internet's important to me. Uh, protecting the Ogallala, Ogallala Aquifer is really important because without that, uh, ag is our top industry won't go very far. And I also am very strong on economic development. I hope to be able to expand on that later. So thank you again to the Farm Bureau. Thank you all for coming. And I look forward to talking with you more about where I stand on things. Thank you. And finally, go ahead, Jared. Uh, thank you, Farm Bureau and everybody that came out tonight. Um, it's, so many people don't get involved in politics. And it's nice to see people that actually care enough to come out. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm originally from western Kansas, a small town called Scott City. Uh, my grandparents were farmers, uh, dryland wheat, Milo farmers, there's very little water in western Kansas. Um, so I grew up around agriculture. Um, I, I can remember working with my grandparents during wheat harvest, um, good fond memories of that. My father is an aerial applicator, retired now, it's a fancy word for a crop duster. So at a young age I had a a love and a passion for aviation and wanted to be a pilot. So at the age of 18, I started flying and received my life, senior in high school, started flying, received my private license at 18, uh, went to Kansas State University on a track scholarship, uh, worked on my commercial license at K-State, also received a, a degree, a Bachelor of Science from Kansas State University. Went back home, was going to work with my, my father and decided I wanted to go back to college again. So went to Fort Hayes State University, have a degree in education, taught school for one year in Kansas City uh, before I realized my passion was aviation. I uh, moved to Oahu in 1997. So I've been in the district for 27 years, most of the time in Saunders County, Oahu. Moved to Butler County four years ago. Uh, great community here in Butler County. 
re really enjoy it. Um, small business owner, have a couple companies, Storm Aeronautics and Storm Flying Service. Um, so I understand what, it's, what, what it means to meet a payroll and, um, and to deal with government regulations. Um, I look forward to sharing more of my, my vision with you later tonight at the table and throughout this forum. Um, I do want to recognize my wife in the back, Colleen. Uh, we have six children, one's married, lives in Omaha, five are still at home, um, go to Aquinas Catholic schools. Um, I, I want to emphasize that I'm a common sense, conservative Christian Republican. Um, and my faith is very, very strong for me, very important. And thank you. All right, thank you. And before we jump into the question, uh, questions, I'd like to thank uh, East Butler FFA. They did some beautiful flower arrangements to put up on the table. So if you know anybody that is involved in the East Butler FFA, please pass along uh, your thanks for the beautiful work that they did. <coughs> All right, first question. Jacob, we'll start with you. The question, and feel free, um, I can repeat the question for you guys as we go down the line. The question is, what committees in the legislature would you like to serve on if elected? Yeah, great question. Should I be given a choice uh, to serve on a committee? Uh, it would, the first one I would like to be on would be TNT, Transportation and Telecommunications. Senator Bosselman has made it a priority of his. He's been chair of it uh, for this last whole term. Uh, and I think he's done a great job at advocating for the rural areas about getting our roads safer, new roads and bridges repaired or built, and definitely broadband access to connect those communities. So that's probably my priority is to be on that committee. The other one I'd like to be on is appropriations. I want to see where our government is putting its money and making sure it's being allocated to the right places and for the right reasons, that it's all going back into taxpayer services for the quality of life that we can all get behind. And thirdly, on education. Education is super important to me. I understand what it's like uh, to go to a private school and I've studied abroad and seen what it's like in other countries and how their public schools are just far and away outpacing our own. And largely it's because of our tax structure. It's because of how we treat our educational professionals. And so getting on that committee and understanding what is being taught in our public schools, get back to the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, like we, we all grew up on, like what Laura Ingle Wiles grew up, grew up on in Little House on the Prairie. So those are the three committees I would like to serve on. TNT, Transportation, Telecommunications, Appropriations, and Education. Dennis? Well, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as far as committees, you know, I think you just kind of take what you get when you're a freshman senator down there. But I, I'm going to try to request, I believe the Agriculture Committee would be the, the natural fit for me since I've spent my whole lifetime doing agriculture. Agriculture and natural resources as well. Uh, both of those committees are very important to me, and I think I could represent agriculture very well. I also think appropriations is a great committee to be on, and if I get a chance, I'm going to try to do that. Uh, I think every s expenditure needs to be scrutinized, and that'd be one of the best ways to do that, to sit on one of those committees like that, especially appropriations. Thank you. Okay, they've asked if you guys can hold your applause till the end because they want to get through as many questions in the hour and a half that we can. Allie? All right. Uh, number one committee I would like to be on is Health and Human Services. Uh, it, it's the number one committee that deals with pro-life issues. In two years or less, Senator Hansen will be termed out and he'll likely know, he won't be able to be chair of that committee any longer. And my concern is that it will then go to Senator Reapy. Um, he is the most medically inclined left then on the board, and I would like to be able to take over Hansen's position when he's termed out. That is a very important aspect to me, and I'd like to safeguard uh, the unborn from the committee before things can even get to the floor. Additionally, I'd like to um, ask for a request to be put on the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, for a number of reasons, I would like to be able to address election integrity issues as they come up. That committee often handles those issues. Um, as well, they also handle a lot of the veterans and veterans affairs, which has been an issue that has been communicated to me a lot as I talk to constituents and the benefits and fighting for benefits through the VA. 
So I would certainly like to be a part of those conversations. And lastly, the Natural Resources Committee would be uh, an area I'd especially like to dig into. Uh, I live right next to Checkland Lake. It is an NRD lake. Uh, I've worked with and talked to a lot of the NR current NRD members. Uh, my fiance is also running for one of the NRD board positions, and we are inclined to dive into that board. Thank you. Ellen? Well, I'd like to aim high right out of the chute, and that would be appropriations. Uh, there will be an opening in Congressional District 1 with Senator Wish being termed out. Uh, appropriations is where you fund your priorities. That's where the state of Nebraska picks what's the most important to them because it's what they spend the money on. If you're on appropriations committee, that's the one committee you get because of the time it takes to learn all the things. You know, with term limits, it's taken a while. We don't have the days of Senator Joe Warner who knew where every quarter was and had every couch cushion in the state. He knew where the money was, he knew how it was generated, and he knew how to uh, do the budget. If uh, appropriations would not be a reality, I would like to consider ag, uh, because I have a vested interest in ag, and you'll hear more about that a little later. Health and human services would be something I'd be really interested in. We spend billions of dollars in health and human service type things. I can't believe that there aren't some economies of scale savings there, some duplication. It's just something we need to look at. And believing in less government, I think need a lot less regulation. So I'd like to relook at that piece. And finally, I'd like to serve the judiciary. I think one of the things, you know, the three co-equal branches of government, uh, the legal is the last one. And, you know, so you have the executive, you have the legislature and that. And I think a lot of things are happening where decisions are the legislature makes the laws, but the decisions and uh, go with the judiciary. So I'd like to be involved in that. All right, thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, I would say about as far as committees go, um, you know, as a freshman senator, you kind of go where they need you. Um, you get to know the people that are there. They get to know you. Um, you can kind of give some input to what you, where you would like to serve. But ultimately, as a new freshman senator, um, you're going to go where where it's needed. It's a team player. That's exactly what I would do. I would serve anywhere they needed me and use my talents. Uh, the choices, though, I would kind of like is revenue. Um, that's taxes. Taxes come into the government, state government. And so that would be as a small business owner, I have you know experience with, with revenue. And uh, that would be a first choice of mine. Of course, this is a Farm Bureau meeting, agriculture. Um, I work with farmers, and I would have a, an interest with the Ag Committee. Um, a couple other ones would be the um, education. I have a degree in education. I think that's vitally important. I think our public schools um, are good, but I think we need some help with the education and, and what our children are being taught. So that would be a key uh, committee to be on. Also, when you look at property tax relief, education, you want to be on that committee and see, see what's going on there with the revenue. And then last would probably be transportation, telecom in, in that area. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on to our second question. Dennis, we will start with you. The question is, how would you try to change the state's tax structure to reduce the high property taxes? Well, it's been tried for a long time and nothing's been done. Uh, I just gonna wanna remind people that the, the way the tax structure is right now, it's what they call a three-legged stool. So you're Taxing property taxes, income taxes, and sales tax is basic sources of revenue for the state. Uh, the stool is just tilting way to the left because the leg of the property taxes is just way too long. We need to we need to do several different things. I think. Uh, well, first of all, we need to get away from the Tiosa formula. The Tiosa formula is a formula that was. Uh, brought into being many years ago, and the Tiosa formula has changed the tax structure where way, way too much revenue is coming from property taxes to support our schools and things like that. So we need to, we need to uh, revamp the Tiosa structure. And then I think there's, uh, with the Tiosa structure, there's 180 districts in the state that are not getting any revenue for equalization aid. So that's a very bad deal for, for most people. Uh, 
I think property taxes are uh, a very unfair tax. And then uh, everybody needs to pay their fair share. We just, we just don't have uh, an equal support for the, the school systems. So I, I didn't do a very good job answering that question, but uh, every, every expenditure needs to be scrutinized. So thank you. All right, Ali? Well, that's an easy one for me. I support Epic Option. I think we should eliminate property income and corporate taxes and move over to a consumption-based tax. Uh, I know there's been a lot of misinformation and studies that flagrantly ignore entire aspects of the proposition of Epic Option, but it is truly the only tax reform that is for the people. No, it doesn't put the government first. It puts the people first. It makes, it is the most local control. You, the individual, get to determine how much you participate in the tax uh, system. Uh, that being said, right now, the way that the legislation is written, LB 79, it would put state tax at seven, the state consumption tax at 7.5%. This would be on only new items and services, and there would still be the excise taxes on cigarettes and such like that. But we're not talking about a 22% tax. And the studies that specifically say that are completely neglecting to take into account that we're opening up the tax pool to include nonprofit entities, to include big corporations that currently have tax write-offs. And those of you who get to then regain your $10,000 in property or income tax will never, ever, ever be entirely spent on a tax system unless you're buying you know, over $100,000 worth of new items on an annual basis. It is the best tax system for the people. I stand behind it. I don't believe that there's great support for it, but if it gets passed, I'd like to be there to fight for it. Thank you. All right, Alan? Well, this is a perfect opportunity for point, counterpoint. I really don't like Epic Tax. Um, I think it'd kill Main Street, Nebraska. I don't know why you want to give free land to Ted Turner and you're going to encourage more foreign ownership because you take a big part of that expense away. And they're not going to be spending that money in Nebraska. We're the ones who live here, all of us, are going to be sitting here spending the epic tax money as it goes up. I don't think 7.5%. I don't know how that would ever really work. But the big landowners that don't live here um, are the ones that benefit from us doing that. And I also don't really trust sending all of our money to Lincoln and hoping we get the amount back we need to operate government locally. I think local decisions are the best way to run government, and certainly less government. I told you before I was obsessed with property tax. You know, I think we need to start over there, um, because it's just going to keep going up. Two guys, one piece of land comes up. They both want it. They know it's not going to be there for another few generations. So the price goes up, and then everybody's cost goes up. And if you just want to farm, that's where you really get hurt by that. So we need to just start over with property tax. Keep it to maybe what market value was when you bought it for as long as you hold it. There are a lot of different variations I thought of that we can attack this. But this little let's try to tweak it isn't going to work. We need to scrape it and pull the Band-Aid off right away. So thank you. All right. Finally, Jer Jared. Yeah, I try to describe uh, tax policy in two minutes is pr pretty difficult. Um, but the number one thing that no one's really talking about is Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So for two minutes to try to uh, talk about an in-depth tax plan is impossible. Um, like I said, I'm a small business owner. It all starts with cutting spending. Um, I talk to Jim Pillen pretty frequently, a good friend of mine. We'll never have t property tax relief unless we figure a way to cut spending. So every aspect of the government, state government, needs to look at. And you know, like I do, there's wasteful spending in every form of government, from state federal, county, city. So it all needs to be looked at. 
and you have to make some hard choices and decide where we're going to cut. Um, if we're just going to increase the sales tax to lower property tax, is that truly tax relief? You're just going to pay for more thing, more when you go to buy items. So that's that's what you got to look at. Um, I support a broad approach. Um, I'm not an Epic fan. Um, I've read I've read the Epic plan. To me, I don't see how it would ever work. Uh, and you can talk about percentages, seven and a half percent, but based off of what? If I if I lived in Omaha and I could go to another state to buy goods and not pay sales tax, what do you think I'm going to do? So they really can't tell you what percentage people are going to we're going to get in tax from sales tax. And you know, if we adopt Epic, we're going to trash our whole tax. The whole tax system is going to be trashed. We have to start all over and figure out how we're going to do that. Meanwhile, we have no revenue coming into the state. So it would be, um, it would be like going to Las Vegas, push, putting in all your chips and hoping that it's going to work out. And if it doesn't, where are we left? All right. Thanks. Finally, Jacob. So to me, addressing the property tax issue to all of us is about relief and reform. Relief. What can we do to immediately lessen the burden on individuals, families, and businesses, or ag, ag ownership? And that is to provide a valuation cap on property valuations. Just to throw something out there, it would look something like it can, your county assessor cannot increase the value of your home over 2% over, let's say, a four-year period. Something of that nature. That way we're not getting postcards in the mail that say we've gone up 13.5%. Now we're talking about reform and what we can do for that. Number one is revenue diversification. We can increase the sales tax. I'm not a fan of increasing any tax, but that is one that can be done. Other states have had success in doing it. Tennessee has a 9% sales tax. And from what I hear, they are not fleeing Tennessee to go purchase their goods, but they're staying there. They managed to do it and eliminate income taxes entirely all at the same time. And we also need to have a tax structure that recruits businesses into this state so that way more revenue is being streamed and it lessens that burden on our farmers and on our families and thirdly is well definition broadened targeted exemptions for seniors and retirees homesteaders and farmers all right move on now to question three ali you will start what challenges are faced by volunteer fire and ems what solutions should be the legislature address to address those challenges? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know that right now they actually have legislation up to talk about insurance for firefighters. Um, Holdcroft ha has made that one of the issues that he's you know, really dived into. Um, I would absolutely continue to support that effort. I know I was recently talking to one of the firefighters over in Malmo and Probably the insurance and their, their portion of pay-in is the biggest thing that they talked about. Obviously, having funding for new equipment and enough equipment to maintain a, an EMS and, fire, and volunteer firefighters across our district is a huge issue. I do know and absolutely appreciate that in our counties, we have phenomenal community support. And it is amazing how much of our community comes together to raise funds and support the fundraisers of our volunteer fire department and EMS to ensure that they do have the equipment that they need. Alan? Well, I think one of the first places that needs to start is training. Um, that's one of the most vital pieces for firefighters and EMS to have the ongoing training, the learning the new and better, the best practices that are involved. Having the right type of equipment is also very, very important. and not having to worry about all of the liability things and what could happen and did I do the backboard right and all those kinds of things. I think we need to provide protections to them to do their jobs and to do it well. Um, they are a vital part of our community. Recruit, retain uh, is so important because without them, uh, when that whistle blows at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're the ones who jump out of bed and go help someone in need. So anything we can do to support them is something we should look at doing. Jared? <laughs> okay, um, this is near and dear to my heart. My father was the, uh, the volunteer police, or the volunteer fire chief in my hometown of Scott City for years. So was my grandfather. So I know firsthand how important those people are to a community. Uh, first responders will always have my respect. 
Um, you know, when the whistle goes off in the morning or if we have a car wreck or if we have anything like that, they get out, jump out there, first people there, not getting paid to do it. So I have a tremendous re respect for first responders in all law enforcement. Um, I've been to Malmo Fire Department as well and uh, David City Fire Department, spoke to them. I'll be going to Valparaiso, uh, meet with all them. Um, they talk about the excessive regulations for training. Um, I don't know if that's it tied to insurance, but they talk about what it takes to train somebody to be a first responder and to keep the hours up. And it's hard enough to get employees as a business owner. I know it's difficult to hire, keep people hired, but when you're wanting people to uh, jump on a fire truck, jump in an ambulance, and do that kind of work, I can't imagine how difficult that is. So a priority of the state should be to do whatever we can to support EMT first responders. All right, Jared, or excuse me, Jacob. Yeah, um, I was gonna say it was near and dear to my heart, but Jared said it, uh, so it's very close to my heart. Uh, my grandfather was a volunteer fireman his whole life in Washington County. I served as a volunteer EMT in the city of Virginia Beach, which is a city that is greater than the size of Omaha and services a community that is nearly the size of the state of Nebraska. And they have an all volunteer force. If they're able to recruit and retain that, surely our communities can do the same. One of the things that we can do to help our volunteer EMS is it is currently not labeled an emergency services. If we got that in legislation, it would open up budgets for things like the maintenance centers. And we can even couple and partner with the National, National Guard who their maintenance centers are in disarray and in need of repair and in need of qualified mechanics to service the equipment. We can partner with local communities and what they need to also get to those maintenance centers. Thank you. And Dennis. Yes, I think uh, I've spent over 25 years, or I spent 25 years on the Preg Volunteer Fire Department, and I know a lot of the, the people have spent a lot more time at it than I did. And one of the things is the huge regulations that they place on, especially your EMTs, EMTs are required hours and hours of training just to be able to be an EMT. Uh, it didn't used to be that. And they're, they're, much, they're trained much better right now. But here's the thing. Even if you don't completely train those EMTs, they need to be there because doing something is way better than nothing most of the time. Now, there are issues where, you know, you need to know exactly what you're doing, but by the same token, don't require hours and hours of time or travel to different places for training. Uh, I also think uh, we d we're driving people away from doing the EMT work if we do that. So we need to reduce the regulations. And then uh, also I support make sure you support your local fire departments. Come to their uh, open houses. They have uh, pancake feeds and things like that. Those people raise a lot of money just to buy equipment and things like that. So help them out. Thank you. All right, our next question. Alan, we will start with you. What two issues are the most important in our district? Well, I think we'll start with high-speed internet. We are an ag state. And it's a global world now uh, to market your goods, find maybe that next bowl you're going to buy, those kinds of things. You know, back when my dad was doing it years and years and years ago, you'd drive through the country and you'd see something in the trees, say, I think I could take parts off that. Well, now you can look online and say, who has it, where is it, talk to the guy, find out how much he's going to want for that, those kinds of things. So you need high-speed Internet to do your business because we are an entrepreneurial society anymore. So that's really important. And I think protecting, farmers are the best stewards of the land that we have. But we need to protect our Ogallala Aquifer. That's something I really, really worry about because you think of the big lawsuits that have happen, happened recently with Kansas. Colorado's trying to keep more of the water because they're trying to develop the front range of the Rockies. So what is that gonna mean for Nebraska getting it? We've, the legislature, is looking at 600 some million for a canal that we're not 100% sure it's gonna work, but we need to get water to where it's needed to feed the world. So I think those would be the two biggest things we need to do in Nebraska. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, the two biggest priorities I see are lower taxes and lower taxes. Um, I go and knock on doors, talk to people all the time. It's the number one complaint I hear from everybody is how high a taxes we pay in this state. Um, I moved here from Kansas years ago. My wife's from Dallas. 
the first thing my wife did when she came up here is went and licensed her vehicle and about had a heart attack. Um, we just pay huge taxes in the state. So the number one priority, I think, is we have to get a handle on this. And we've talked about it for years, and other people have tried to do this, and it, we just can't seem to figure it out. So I think you need some people who, a person who will go to the state uh, unicameral and fight the good fight and, and really attack this head on. Uh, the second one, I guess, I would say is broadband. Broadband's important in the state. We're never going to develop the state economically uh, the rural areas unless we have high-speed access throughout the whole state. Um, I read on Farm Bureau's website, 39% of rural communities do not have high-speed internet. So that's a huge priority that we need to tackle. Jacob? Yeah, as I knock the doors too, I hear a, a lot of issues. Uh, that's great. I love learning about them. And, but the two biggest ones are, number one, property tax tied in with inheritance tax. We are in danger of losing the generational farm, and we cannot afford to give that away because China or Bill Gates or someone like that is going to buy it up and take the profits away from Nebraska and away from the family. And that ties into my second, what I've heard is the biggest issue, and it's one issue that I've lived, are resources for young families. We are suffering from a brain drain here in District 23 in all of rural Nebraska. We are losing talent to other states. We're losing them to the big cities. And it's often because of lack of resources for young families, those being affordable rural housing. We're seeing developments go up, starting price $385,000. That is not feasible for a young starter family. Great thing about this district is there are multifamily complexes going up for starter families, townhomes being sold just near me in Cedar Bluffs, and then newer developments as these city councils are trying to rear in these contractors and these developers and capping that price at a $275,000 home. In addition to that, child care, making sure it is, first of all, available, affordable, and most importantly, that it's safe. And thirdly, that broadband access that a bunch of us have already spoken about, that's also a safety issue, is being able to stay connected to emergency services, to other family members, and your neighbors. Dennis. These are all really great ideas, and I can't disagree with just about anything anybody said here. Uh, I think, though, the number one issue to me is the unborn. We have taken the, the emotion out of the word abortion. Uh, it's taking a life. You're not protecting a human being. We've called the unborn a fetus just to take away the meaning of what's happening. And so to me, pro-life is the number one issue. Once we've got that straightened out, let's talk about taxes. I agree with Jared, taxes, taxes, taxes. That thing is always on everybody's mind. And taking away the family farm, that's another issue, Jacob. Uh, I think we need to kill the death tax. Simple as that. And Ellie. Uh, well, as I'm out talking to people, the two biggest issues that others share with me, because my, my two most important issues might vary on a day-to-day -day basis, but the two that I hear most from people are taxes, that they're too high, that they're, they're reducing the number of people who can enter the workforce, they're sending people off to other states where there are no property taxes or inheritance tax. Uh, so that is definitely the biggest one. Uh, the second issue that I hear most often from people is that they've lost all faith in their representation. Most of them don't even know why they would go vote because politicians show up and they say one thing and then tomorrow they do another. Um, and I commiserate with them very, very much. That's exactly why I'm running because I'm sick and tired of being lied to. I'm sick and tired of being used. I'm sick and tired of being told, well, we have to fund the government so you guys just need to give us your hard-earned dollars. And those are the two biggest issues I hear about. That is what I would especially like to go deal with. And that's really all I have. All right, question five. Jared? What should be the future of power generation look like in Nebraska? Uh, two things power needs to be is reliable and affordable. That's the two main things. And in Nebraska, we're actually very fortunate to have that. Um, and I know Mark Kirby here in town pretty well, Butler County Power. Um, and, and they do a great job around here with just that reliable uh, power. So as far as, as that goes, we also need to 
um, encourage ethanol production. I'm learning all about that, and um, it's been very, very enlightening. Ethanol is clean. It's uh, good for the environment, way better than the other source. And it's also, um, it's grown right here in Nebraska. So when we're, we're supporting ethanol, we're supporting our farmers, and that's, that's very, very important. Um, also, uh, biodiesels are important too. And the, the new frontier is uh, fuel for aviation. Uh, and that is the new frontier for um, biofuels for aviation. They have a new facility in Georgia that just opened up, and that has tremendous amount of prob promise for us here in Nebraska where we grow corn. And I'm all about supporting farmers wherever we can. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Jacob. So when I went to the Naval Academy, I actually studied uh, wind production in my ocean engineering class, and that was what my whole senior year was dedicated to. Now, I'm not a fan of wind production necessarily throughout the Midwest. That's an offshore thing where it is reliable and it is affordable. But what it does here is it just ruins our land and it causes just loud wreckage and it, it makes it almost impossible to farm the land that these massive wind farms are on. We've seen it in Iowa and we're seeing it in Indiana. That being said, the future of power generation, we have to have it be reliable and that is fossil fuels as a base power. But we can diversify the portfolio. It is a shame that the Obama administration shut down the nuclear power plant because that was clean, affordable, reliable energy. Uh, we saw what happened in the, in the freeze just two months ago. People's furnaces were going out. We couldn't get propane to fill up the tanks. And nuclear power would have solved that problem if we had just diversified the portfolio. If we can fight back against the EPA to make sure that, like what Jared said, that it is available and it is affordable and it is reliable. We can also harness, harness the power of the water within the state and hydroelectric options are out there. Nebraska is the Indian word for land of flat water. Let's utilize our namesake. Let's utilize our resources, diversify that portfolio while fighting back against any property rights that could be injust, that could come under an injustice and eminent domain from the state. It's not the state's role to tell you what power needs to run through your land. Dennis? Again, I agree. These, these guys have got some really good ideas. And nuclear power is one of the things that I think has been really given a bad name. Uh, it's been very affordable, and it's a reliable source. Uh, wind power is not reliable. Uh, solar power is not reliable. And both of those, ty both of those uh, types of uh, power generation create real eyesores to the community. And they don't last forever. Uh, you put up that wind tower, it costs a ton of money to put that wind tower up. And they're, they're replacing uh, windmill blades, and those blades go into landfills. They don't recycle. Uh, you have a uh, hailstorm that comes by and destroys uh, your uh, solar panels. Those things are a huge mess, and they're not recycling those, those things either. So those are items that we need to really be careful about. Uh, also, lithium-ion batteries, all the resources that it takes, natural resources that it takes, come from overseas to build these batteries. And we're having uh, slave labor mine these types of uh, products that they use to build the batteries. Uh, so those, none of those are really good issues. It's wasteful. It creates a blighted uh, uh, scene after, after you uh, replace those, or try to, if you try to replace those uh, towers and uh, solar farms. So we need nuclear power, coal power, uh, biofuels. Another great issue is biofuels. Ellie? Oh, I, what they said, I totally echo. I was actually reading a fascinating article recently on nuclear hubs uh, and making a smaller hub that can actually be uh, made into a mobile unit and moved around to where you would need it. So in circumstances where a grid does collapse, you could actually put one of these hubs nearby and, and have power at a much quicker pace, again, cheaper, more efficient. Uh, but I believe first and foremost in an open and free market. I believe that consumers know what they want and I think that the best way to protect that is to put nullification in place on the end of the federal government with the EPA. They put the regulations in place that prevent us from moving forward in the market that works best for our state. And the most important thing that we can do is become independent in energy resources. 
We can't always count on others to come to our rescue. We've seen that time and time again with natural disasters uh, across this country. And it's important that we support any of those opportunities. I will say and do recognize that solar and wind power is not well supported in this state, though somehow they continue to gain funds through our government to put them up all across our districts and our country. And I would certainly like to go figure out how that's occurring and put a stop to it if we can. And go ahead, Alan. These forums get boring when we all agree. So prepare to be bored. Nuclear energy and fossil fuels are our two biggest ones right now. Uh, the other thing we, I think, need to be really aware of is our power grid. It is really aging infrastructure and something that it doesn't matter where you produce it if you can't get it to where it's needed. So I think we need to focus on that. Um, I would also echo the fact that wind is not a good option here. Yeah, it blows all the time. We can all agree on that. But they say it takes more energy for that windmill to move than it actually produces. It's not a very cost-effective way of providing power. We need reliable power. We need the infrastructure to get it to where it's needed. And I think the best technology we have currently are fossil fuels and nuclear. All right, we'll move on to question six. And Jacob, we will start with you. What ideas do you have for funding local government entities, as in schools, counties, cities, NRDs, et cetera, to help reduce property taxes but still retain local control? Yes, great question, and, and a complicated one at that. You'd have to, to spend an entire, probably four-year course at the University of Nebraska trying to understand how these, all the different funds and entities that are being funded and where it's going. But for me, it really comes down to how do we prevent the state giving all these school boards all this extra money, but the school board claiming they need more. So they came and raised the levy. They came or they just increased the property valuations. That comes into spending controls. We still let the local government decide what their levy is and how they want to spend the money. But if you're receiving state aid from the Nebraska legislature through your income tax or other revenue means, then that has to come with the spending control and a leash tied to it so that your state or your school boards and your county commissioners can't just go and say, we got all this extra money, but we do need more. We're going to save it in reserve. We know that that's what they're doing. Uh, especially in Butler, Butler County, from what I understand, is, is really raising the taxes across the board. And so those spending controls tied to state aid still leaves control for the locals to decide, I will use this money and these taxes for these funds, but I can't go out of bounds. Dennis? Okay, I guess I'd like to see, uh, you know, we, we talk about putting cash on spending and things like that. I think caps on spending would be a really good idea, but in a, as far as the, the tax system, I think we, we need to not worry about what the tax levy is. We need to quit worrying about what the valuation is and put a cap on the things that they spend. So if you, if you just quit worrying about the levy and the, and the valuation and put a cap on every, every dollar that's spent or the budget for every year, if you put a percentage cap on the increase in your budget by dollar amount, every year you can control your spending. And it doesn't matter if the valuation goes up 22% or 2%. They're only going to be able to tax you so much. But I do also think there's a way that we need to worry about or we need to try to get some of the uh, support for our local governments, our, our county governments and our state uh, or our uh, schools and things like that need to come from the state where the state really has more responsibility for the, the dollars spent in our, our schools. And um, so if we keep spending by dollar amount and not worry about what the levy is, then we're going to be able to uh, control the, the amount of dollars that were taxed. Allie. You bet. What idea do you have for funding local government entities like schools, counties, cities, NRDs, et cetera, to help ensure property taxes, or reduce property taxes, excuse me, but retain local control? Okay, great question. So again, from the Epic Option line, uh, line, which is really what I think works best, you take the spending power away. Um, asking a government to reduce their spending 
never happens. They don't, they don't give the money back. They find another place to put it, and they spend it there instead. Uh, so I think that should be taken away from them. And I think from there that we should create a new formula. Again, like he said earlier, scrap Teosa. Uh, it's a terrible system. And, and figure out, take a set standard of cost per student and ensure that each school is funded with what they need. Uh, but waiting for them to stop spending like we saw last session where the legislature gave them an extra $800,000 so that they would, each district would reduce their property taxes and give us relief, they didn't do so. They took that money and they still raised property taxes. So waiting for them to do it on their own I don't think is going to happen. You, the people in this audience who can vote on this petition uh, to eliminate those taxes so that they have to work with the con within the confinements of a budget is going to be the best way to uh, reach a solution. Ellen? I'm old enough to remember Senator Rakes, and when Teosa was done, I sat down with him. Um, May he rest in peace. But Teosa has outlived its usefulness. It needs to be looked at. Um, years ago, the Revenue Committee and the legislature took away aid to cities, counties, and NRDs um, in a way to save money. Local control is still a good way to do things, but we need to really reduce property taxes, and they can still fund parts of schools. But I think anybody who wants to build something new needs to go before a vote of the people if you're gonna spend more money. The biggest shell game we have is levies because values go up. We kept your levy the same, but you're still bringing in more money because it's a never ending thing. It's gonna keep going. It has to be capped. Funding schools is the state's responsibility. And so we need to figure out what's the best formula, whether it's a sales, income tax adjustment. Um, again, you're just shifting taxes. Yeah, we're shifting taxes because you can't stay with property taxes so long. Um, and I, I'm sick and tired of, it seems like the state never reduces their expenditures anyway. You formulate a budget, you do your expenditures to meet what you're going to have as revenue, and then you quit. You quit spending. There's a difference between wants and needs. I grew up in a time where every town had a school and you knew where it was by the name of the town. They've consolidated. And uh, I think you can save some money on some superintendents and that kind of thing. And Jared. Yeah, I'm all for funding students, not a system. And I think that TIOSA, which they've talked about here, is horribly complicated. So I'm not going to go into all that. I don't even understand it completely. I don't think anybody can, really. Um, but we need to have equal uh, revenue for each student in the state. I don't care if you live in David City or if you live in Omaha or if you live in the Sand Hills. It's got to be equal. Um, and that's, that's the first thing we have to, to understand. And we have to stop spending. I, I, I keep coming back to that. Everybody wants more and more and more. There has to be a, we have to stop spending on the state level. And, you know, when you get into um, the fact that, that schools are getting the, the money now and spending it, and then the taxpayers are paying huge property taxes, there has to be some type of cap on that. But we have to keep in mind that there has to be some system in place to override those caps in a time of emergencies or if we have a natural disaster or if the, the people in that community want to go above those, cop, the, those caps and will, are willing to vote on a bond issue. So you know, I'm for a cap system, but we have to have a system there that's fair in, in, for certain cir circumstances. Thank you. Our seventh question, Dennis, we will start with you. What safeguards, if any, should be in place to protect Nebraskans from out-of-state entities or from foreign governments from owning farmland? That's a really tough question to answer because I think you have to be real careful with what you wish for. If you start putting regulations on who can buy land, are you going to say that somebody from Canada can't buy land or somebody from uh, some friendly country, let's just say friendly countries, or are you going to say no one from any outside country can buy land in the state? Uh, I, I do understand that we need to do something with some of our adversaries uh, from the Russians. I was going to say Soviet Union, but that goes a little too far back, doesn't it? From the Russians or uh, Iran, China, uh, 
even Cuba, let's say, uh, all these all these countries, they don't wish us any good, and they're buying land in strategic locations near missile bases or or defense areas in our state. So I think we do need to really have uh, r really ex explore what we can do to, to stop that kind of purchases. And I think that's more of a federal issue, but I do know that the, the state has to get involved too and make sure that the, the federals know what is important in the state. So we do need some regulation, and I'm not exactly sure what we can do to that, but we need to make sure we keep our federal delegation informed. Ellie. Oh, um, that's a, it's an interesting question because there, there's actually different answers depending on whether we're talking about uh, outsiders but still within this country or if we're talking about foreign entities, which can be two different things and one and the same. I know one of the big concerns has been Bill Gates coming in and buying up tens or hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland and for what purpose, not everybody knows. Uh, what I think it really comes down to, and I think the best way to address these issues is going to be from the local county level and city level. I think that they're in the best position to implement regulations on land use, especially through our zoning, and ensuring that the meetings stay in place for the public input to be there to ensure that land is being used properly. That being said, and on top of it, I think a large reason we see these plots of land going up for sale and then being swooped <laughs> up by investors on the outside is because of the property taxes and the inheritance tax. And if we were to eliminate those uh, areas of taxation, I think that a lot more of Nebraska land would be retained by Nebraskans and we wouldn't see as much of it going up for sale uh, simply because people can't afford to, to keep their land and their, and their space. Uh, I do know, for example, right now we have one plot that I think it was like 400,000 acres um, that's up for sale right now. And the biggest hurdle with that has been that that landowner doesn't want to split it up. And, and because of that, it makes it hard to find uh, investors here locally. Ellen? This is a very difficult thing to do in the free market system. It's for sale. People have a right to sell for the price they want to get. But I have no problem saying, why can't we say no to foreign ownership? Why should we be selling parts of America to people outside of it who have different interests than we have? I think saying no to foreign ownership is okay. Uh, I'm not gonna apologize for it. Someone wise once said to me, you know, hold on to farmland. They don't make any more of it. It's finite and it's important. And one of the other risks we have are people, you know, I read something very recently that there are five farmers over 65 for every one under 35. That's a trend that's dangerous. That means they're going to have to get bigger and bigger like they have been doing. And sometimes people inherit a farm and they have no interest in mom and dad's livelihood and what they did. They went to college, they got some big city job, and they might own it here but aren't really that interested in what happens. They get their check, their cash rent or whatever every once in a while, and that's the most they're interested in it. But the question was foreign ownership, and I'm perfectly fine with saying no to people outside the United States owning farm ground. Jared? Um, yeah, uh, this is a hot topic. You know, if you watch TV, it's just widely talked about. First of all, any adversaries of the United States or Nebraska should not be able to buy our land. I think that's common sense. Um, especially around sensitive areas. You talk about Offutt Air Force Base. You talk about the missile bases out western Nebraska. We should never be selling our land to foreign companies, countries next to that. Um, recently, the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, allowed for natural asset companies to start purchasing land, try to pass that through, purchase land in the United States, and it was stopped by uh, Pete Ricketts and Mike Flood. And that was very important because they were going to allow foreign com countries to come in here and start to buy land in the United States for whatever reason. So our local leadership within the state was on the front line to stop that. Um, but you have to also realize that there's, there's some countries that are our allies, and we don't want to sit there and limit, you know, working with those companies. Um, in the seed corn production, we have certain companies from different countries that we work with. So you got to be kind of careful about this and not just shut off um, everyone from a foreign country in this in 
the state of Nebraska. It's a worldwide market. And Jacob. Again, I just don't want to echo what they're saying, but I'm in full agreement. I will always be America first, and I will always be Nebraska first. And if we are going to sell this land to Iowa, who I may consider as an adversary to Nebraska, some of you may disagree, uh, but the, the profit to billionaires, to tech, the profits need to be kept in Nebraska. It's hard to say I'm for property rights and tell a farmer he can't sell his land. Kids don't want it. He, he's got to, he or she has to sell. It's hard for me to say, no, you can't do that. But the profits have to be kept in Nebraska. We have these Facebook centers going up, Google centers going up. Those profits are going to California. They're going to New York. We may have a temporary workforce to build them for two, three years, and then the workforce will just leave to build one in Montana. So the profits have to be kept in Nebraska. And I am 100% okay with saying no to any foreign government, regardless of if it's Canada, the Bahamas, or China, in buying up our land. And the state actually has taken measures to prevent that. Uh, the governor has worked into, when apply for, applying for an LLC, as an ag company, as any company, you have to list your partners. And there are huge fees and huge tax uh, increases if you do have foreign ownership within those because they see how much is being bought. They say you're buying 46,000 acres. They, the governor's office really looks into that, double checks those partners listed on it, and if they have foreign ownership, they do go after them. We need to increase that. And our final question before the lightning round, I told you guys this would go fast tonight. Allie, we're going to start with you. What past experiences in your life will give you the ability to work with others with different views to build a consensus? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, as I mentioned, I run a grassroots group called Nebraskans Against Government Overreach, and we very regularly take uh, the hard line on very controversial issues. Uh, we also take, give input and participate, and me specifically, uh, in lesser controversial issues. And through my last four years of doing this, I have developed a keen understanding and actually have the ability to ply conversation and discussion even with those I don't agree with. Um, I am proud to say I've never actually lost a debate like one-on-one, -on -one, especially on Facebook. I've changed minds, it's amazing. Um, and I'd like the opportunity to go do so at our legislature throughout the last several years. And one big one that we did was in 2022, uh, I helped Senator Hansen pass LB906. That was the bill that required religious exemption to the COVID-19 shot. That was a controversial issue. But because we worked hard and we did a lot of research and we talked to a lot of people, we were able to get the majority vote to pass LB906. I'm not afraid of the hard work. I will talk to anybody and everybody. One of my favorite sayings is he who hates correction is stupid. And it's true, if you're not willing to take in more information and talk with people, then you're not actually representing the people, you're not listening, you're just pushing your own agenda. And so I'd like the opportunity and think I would do a very, very good job at communicating and working with all of the senators to accomplish any goal. Alan? I've got this. <laughs> you know, I served as mayor for 12 years. I look out in the crowd and I see a few people that I've had to talk to about things that they've disagreed and they're still scowling at me. I've been mayor for two years almost, so I, I think you have to move on from those kinds of things. I don't hold any grudges. I have, uh, the legislature's nonpartisan, but it really is not anymore. It is very partisan. We, it's a 33 vote cloture majority for Republicans right now, so Republican agenda moves better, and that's a great thing when you're Republican. What I worry about is, what if it ever shifts and then you don't have those votes needed to get important policies through? Uh, you've got to have consensus. You've got to work with people with all kinds of different ideas and try to explain yourself and articulate yourself the best way you can and talk about differences and try to understand the other person's perspective. You can only know what they are talking about by walking a little bit in their shoes and trying to understand. And I always try to do one thing. I would say, give me the best argument against the position I'm currently in to see if something will move the needle any to change my mind. So you've got to be able to listen first and hopefully make decisions based on a wide range of information that you can gather. All right, Jared. 
Well, I've got five children at home between the ages of nine and 17, so I'm getting really good at working with people with opposing views to get things done. <laughs> it's a constant battle, um, teenagers especially. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're a very polarized time in this country. Um, you know, you have, a, you have a radical right, radical left, truly is, and they hate each other. And you see it all the time, and they're never going to work with each other. And it's scary. Um, when I go out and knock on doors and talk to people, you know, I hear a lot of that. But what I really hear is people, most of them are in the middle. Most of them want to get things done. They want to see Nebraska move forward. They want to see their city move forward. They're tired of the fighting. They're tired of the, the just the, the sort of craziness. And so I think a person has to realize that, you know, you have to listen to other people. You have to work with other people. You're not always going to agree with that person. But you have to sit there and listen to what they have to say. But you also have to keep your core values in place and not compromise. And when I'm down in Lincoln, I will definitely do that. I will fight the good fight. I will keep my core values in place. But I will definitely, where I can compromise on certain issues for the greater good, um, I will definitely do that. Jacob? So when I was a naval officer, I had the privilege to serve with all the different services at different points in my career. I had the privilege to serve with certain all different kinds of countries, from the Dutch in Greenland, uh, the Danish in Greenland, to the Brits, to the Scots, to the Tunisians, uh, to the Cypriots and the Greeks. Uh, but not only that, I served with sailors from all over the country, uh, and some of them even from the world. And really what we had to focus on at all times was the mission. And we had so much coming down from when we shifted from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Uh, and just all the different policies that shifted from then. I also had to lead during the COVID time, all the policies that came out there, the lockdowns, the vaccine mandates, and how we navigate through that with differing opinions and dissent, often dissenting opinions, my own as well. But it was about being mission focused and what's the best for my detachment of sailors, what's best and what's gonna accomplish this mission. What, one big thing was I had a trans sailor and I'm not here to talk about the LGBTQ community, but you can imagine that a small group of naval divers uh, having a trans sailor in that as we're traveling all over the world, that's going to cause a lot of ruffled feathers. It's going to cause a lot of heartache. It's going to make things very difficult when we go to strict countries like Tunisia and how we can still accomplish the mission, how we can still each represent ourselves and our own beliefs. But we came together and build that consensus. And the biggest piece of my consensus experience, I convinced my wife from Panama City, Florida to move to Colon, Nebraska. And Dennis. So yes, uh, I think, I believe that you do have to keep your core values. I believe you have to stand by issues that are very important to you, close to your heart. But there are issues where you can make a consensus. Uh, sometimes you get nothing done if you, if you aren't willing to give in to the other side. I'm willing to listen. I don't necessarily uh, think I will give in all the time but I do know that I'm willing to listen to f find the other side of the story. I'm not always right, uh, so I, I absolutely know that. Uh, so a little bit of giving from my side and a little bit of giving from the opposite side will get something done that's for the good of the community and for the good of the state. So I think that's the most important thing. We need to get something done that's good for the state. Now, I'm not in a, a big fan of passing a lot of laws either. I think we've got a hell of a lot of laws in, in effect right now, and maybe we need to get rid of some of the laws. <laughs> and maybe we can reach a consensus on that kind of thing. Thank you. Up next is a lightning round. You guys do not need to stand up because you got less than 10 seconds. Um, we're going to just answer for, against, or yes or no, whatever you're comfortable with. We'll start first with you, Jacob. Opportunity scholarships. Four. Dennis? Four. Allie? Uh, neutral. Alan? Neutral. Jared? Support. Term limits? Support. I thought we were going to switch. <laughs> support. 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 Absolutely support. School choice? Support. 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 Second Amendment? Support. support. They can't hear your head nod. Support. 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 Absolutely support. Pro-choice, pro-life. 
Pro-life, no exception. Pro-life. Pro-life, no exceptions. Pro-life at conception. Life begins at conception, pro-life. Perkins Canal. Neutral. Neutral to positive. Uh, neutral also. Fully supportive if it works. Support. All right. With that, we are now going to go into our final uh, opportunity to make your closing comments. And we'll have two minutes to do that. Just to folks, I know that a lot of your questions didn't get answered, but the candidates will be back at their tables and you will have the opportunity during the social hour to ask more one on one questions. So, with closing comments, Alan, we will start with you. And you do need to stand again. Well, thank you. Yep. I'm glad I get to go first. Susan told us to have fun. So, Dennis. Den he's lived longer than I have. He's lived in the district longer than I have. He's been married longer than I have. And he has hair. <laughs> Good hair. I finished second in all those categories. So, as not to appear greedy, I'm sure he will support me finishing first on May 14th. <laughs> no? He's a work in progress. I'll keep working on him. Um, one of the important things to me is economic development. People can talk about it. I've done it. I was involved very early on with AGP and their $700 million bean crushing plant that came here, working on getting them electricity, the infrastructure they need, water, sewer, the road going there. Uh, that was an important investment in David City. Timpty was thinking about moving to Kentucky when I was the mayor. And one of the dumbest or smartest things I ever did is I sat across from the CEO of Timpty and I said, you can move to Kentucky, but the people that made you successful are here and they're not going to Kentucky. And then I thought that was really dumb. But then he said, I agree with you. Um, also, it was funny because the day that they announced that they were going to stay in David City, the Nebraska Department of Economic Development called and said, Mr. Mayor, I think there's less than a 50% chance they sit day. And I said, this morning they announced they're staying. He goes, crickets. And then he goes, I'll call you back. Click. He never called me back. Um, and finally, Acres, getting them to stay and commit to David City. Um, I'm going to run out of time, but really quickly, Farm Bureau asked one word to describe us, and mine was loyal. And I'll be happy to share the story that makes me loyal moving on. But I'm a rule follower, and my time is up. Jared. Um, I want to thank Farm Bureau once again for having this forum and everybody coming out. Um, I'm a common sense, conservative, Christian Republican. Um, I also want to kind of differentiate myself from everybody up here. I'm a small business owner who works in the ag sector, so I can kind of bridge that gap with agriculture and uh, small business. I think that's very, very important. I think that would be very useful in the state legislature down there to represent District 23. Um, this is a rural district, but we do have some communities that are up and coming and growing, and so I think that I would serve well with that. Um, I'd also say I'm not a politician. I'm a public servant, and I um, heard that just the other day, and I thought that was a great phrase. Um, I'm in this to serve, serve the people. Um, I was never in the military, kind of one of my regrets in life. I kind of wish I would have served in the military, uh, but now's my time to serve, and oftentimes when people in the military, they leave their children, they leave their business, they make a lot of sacrifices to go and do something. And that's what serving in the Union Capital is. I'm going to leave my family to some degree. I have five young children at home. Um, I'm going to leave my businesses to some degree. And, but I, it's worth it to go to Lincoln and represent the people. And so that's what I truly plan on doing. I think it's the right time. It's the right place for me to do that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Jacob. I love being here tonight. I love seeing all these faces, the legacy of Nebraska really in this room. And I, I took notes here because I'm learning from each of the candidates here because I think, wow, that's a great idea. I should have said that. Uh, but my time was up. Uh, but now I get you again. Uh, if I've had the pleasure to meet you at your door, uh, hopefully you also shared the pleasure. Uh, but I'll, now I'll introduce myself by saying my name is Jacob Wolf. I'm a fifth generation Nebraskan. I'm a former naval officer and soon to be father. And for my wife, she's not here tonight because it could be any day now, it could be any hour from now when that's going to happen. And I want to preserve the sixth generation of my family 
and your family. And so we got into this race to represent that and spread a message that this is Nebraska and we can invest here. We can invest our businesses, as some of the folks here have done, as you all likely have done, and we can invest our family. When we sat down, my wife and I, when we were in Virginia Beach, where were we gonna raise our family when I got out of the Navy? We chose Nebraska because this community, what we're all here for, what the rest of our counties stand for, is truly that Nebraskan mentality, equality before the law, and protecting the most vulnerable among us, our unborn, our children, our senior citizens. And that's why I'm in this race, to preserve the legacy that you all have helped build and represent the next generation of Nebraskans. I have a worldwide experience, and so I bring that to the table without sacrificing any of the principles that we all grew up in here in The Good Life. Dennis. Well, I do want to thank all of you for being here tonight and uh, giving your support for the whole community. And uh, I know that you all care about what's going on here. And I want to let you know that I deeply care. I care about our state. I care about our area. Our District 23 is very important to me. I, I care about our country. I've served in the Navy, as you know. Uh, I've been doing community service basically for the last 25, 30 years uh, in the fire departments, in every commodity organization that we have in the state. Uh, I've, I've been serving as uh, a director in most of these organizations as well. Right now I serve on a Farm Bureau in Saunders County. I serve in the Rural Radio Association Board of Directors and I'm a director for the state of Nebraska with the uh, Nebraska Soybean Association and the American Soybean Association. So I want to let you know that through my life, I've always thought about serving the community and serving the country. And nobody here is going to match my passion for my country. And for I might not be the most articulate person here, but nobody can match the heart that I have for this, this issue. And I want, to, I want to represent you in the state of Nebraska down in Lincoln. Thank you. And Allie. Well, I won't necessarily agree with him that he thinks he loves the state most. I, I sing the national anthem to my babies when they were infants. I was raised out on it. It was either Christian music, country music, or American music. That was about it. I have a love so deep that when I discovered that there is government overreach in every facet of our life in my early 20s, I couldn't just stand by and watch it. This is something I cannot not do. God has put this path before me. And he's not letting me turn back. It's amazing. I am I'm going through this and knocking on doors and talking to people. And every day he reminds me why I'm doing this. And truly, it comes down to the fact that we need medical freedoms in our Constitution. People need to be able to have a choice. And I never want to see our government be able to take those freedoms away. The ability for you to have a livelihood because they deemed an emergency out of thin air simply because they chose to. And the reality is, guys, they could do that again anytime they want. We have nothing in place to stop them from doing that. And that needs to be corrected. I am on a mission, but I want to help people. I want to help you guys. I, I, when the mandates first came down, I probably responded to 1,000 or 2,000 emails individually from Nebraskans across the state who are about to lose their jobs, who are about to be kicked out of the National Guard, who are about to lose their retirement. And I helped every single one of them with either exemptions or with communicating with their employer or finding a lawyer to fight them in, in court. And we were more successful than not. But again, that work's not done. And that ability for our government to just come in and take freedoms away from us, that should scare every single one of us to death. That is a tyrannical government. And I would like to go fight for Nebraskans to ensure that that's not happening here. All right, let's give our candidates all a round of applause, please. They will all be at their different tables. If you would like to take the opportunity, if you've got some one-on-one -on -one questions you would like to ask, and a shameless plug, if you are not a member of Nebraska Farm Bureau, whether it's Colfax, Butler, or Saunders County, let us know. We'll get you taken care of. With that, have a safe trip home, and thanks for coming tonight.